What's up guys, my name is Tim Gratani. Tim Gratani, welcome. Our next guest got rich the legal way. Tim Sykes is a self-made millionaire trader and the creator of the Millionaire Challenge, a challenge taken by Tim Gratani, the man sitting next to him, a 24-year-old who hit the million-dollar mark trading last month. Trader Timothy Sykes, in fact, says recent college graduate Tim Gratani turned $1,500 into more than a million bucks by following his strategy. Let me again thank Tim, Michael Good, uh, Nate Investors Live. All these guys have helped me so much along the way and really laid the building blocks to turning me into the trader that I am now. Uh, I couldn't have done it without those guys, so give them all a round of applause. All right, so my main strategy, I basically have turned into a trader who trades mainly stock promotions and momentum OTC stocks. And what I really do with these is I trade them completely from the technical side. Basic support and resistance. I really don't use advanced technical indicators, nothing like that at all. And uh, just follow price action completely. Don't care about fundamentals, don't care about what the press releases say. Uh, I just really trade all of these like they are giant pieces of shit, because really a lot of these OTC stocks are. And the less I buy into the story, the less I know about that, the less I can convince myself to hold a bad position if it's starting to go against me, with the hopes of it maybe coming back. Uh, one of the main technical indicators I use along with the charts, I love watching level two. Level two complements it so beautifully. And I'd get into level two here a little bit today. I'd show you some videos, break down how I analyze it a little bit. But that would just take way too long and go over my time slot. So seriously, guys, email me. Feel free. I'm happy to share videos with you. I have a few that I've done back in the day for friends. And uh, I think that you can use them as a really good learning tool. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I got started. Uh, so February 2011, I first hear the name Tim Sykes. Back in late 2010, I had opened a little $500 trading account with ShareBuilder or something like that with the idea of, OK, I'm going to learn a, bit, a little bit about the stock market through trading because I had a finance major and I figured I wanted to go in the stock market direction with that. And my plan just was to jump in randomly, make any kind of trades I wanted, and just sell them when they were at a profit. And within two weeks, my $500 account was a $250 account. So I shut things down. I took some time off, decided I needed to learn what I was doing, actually get a little bit of education, and happened to stumble across Tim, like I said, early 2011. And I'm very, very fortunate I did. And started trading in May 2011. I had followed him for about three months. I had joined Penny Stocking Silver right out of the gate. Just was watching his video lessons, poking my head in the chat room here and there. I was still juggling trading with classes. So I wasn't doing it full time or anything like that. But I just was trying to lay a little bit of groundwork, get a basic idea of what technical analysis was. And uh, eventually decided to fund an account, get going on my own. And at the time, I didn't have much money to my name. I only had $1,500. And I did start with $13,000 between accounts. That's because my parents were generous enough to lend me $11,000. And uh, I used this money not to trade with. I would not trade with a penny of their money. But it really was just to keep accounts open. I split my money between three brokers. It helped me so that I had more day trades. It helped me because with interactive brokers and the 250 rule, I could take a little bit more sizable positions while still keeping my dollar size under control. And uh, it really was a big help early on to have that extra capital. But early on, uh, you know, Tim showed you my profit chart earlier. Uh, it wasn't all up. It started pretty rough. And I started trading full time right around August, and that's when I started tracking on Profitly. I had been up a little bit trading part time, but August is when I really focused in, got more time to trade, and it started really ugly. And I made a lot of mistakes early on. Despite all the video lessons, all the teaching from the gurus, I still had to take that market experience and make my own mistakes. And a lot of these struggles that I had early, some of these might sound familiar to you guys. It was, I was following Tim's alerts only. I was just blindly following. Uh, the pattern day trader rule still was a problem for me. I would let it craft my trades because I was trying to save day trades and stuff like that. I didn't have the right brokers early on. I would definitely have a huge problem with emotional trading and over trading also. I would chase losses. I would do all kinds of terrible things. So I'm going to go through these a little bit, talk about what I did to fix them, and just talk a little bit more about the troubles I had with them. So the first problem was mindlessly following alerts. And of course, I wanted to learn Tim's strategy. But when I first found his service, I looked at his beautiful profitly chart. I looked at his trades. I went as far as to plot out his entry and exit points and figure out what they would mean to my $1,500 account if I was just following what he said to do. If I just bought when he said buy, sold when he said sell. 
And I pretty quickly found out it doesn't work that way. And it's not Tim's fault. It's not that Tim gives bad alerts. The problem is that the market just moves too fast, and it was impossible to match the prices. But because I was in this follow alerts mentality, what I would do is I would still be stubborn about it, and I would chase his alerts. He would say buy, and I'd still buy it 10 cents later. He'd say sell, and I'd sell 10 cents later. And even on his big winning trades, I was getting out for much smaller percentage gains than him, just because I wouldn't think about what I was doing. I would just wait for Tim's instruction. And what really helped me with, uh, along the way with this is when I finally had realized that wasn't working for me. I had to stop blindly following alerts, and I had to actually learn what he was doing. So not only would I just like sit back and only watch his trading alerts, but then I would watch his video lesson at the end of the day. And I'd see what his reasoning was, why he entered the trade, what his line of thinking was that made him exit. And I used that to learn a little bit more about what he was doing and the logic behind it. And I stopped chasing. And ch stopping chasing was one of the big things that helped get my losses under control early, because chasing is one of the most destructive things you can do to your account. Now I still will trade Tim every now and then, uh, but the only way I'll enter his alerts is in one of two situations. Situation number one is if he alerts the trade and I immediately know what the ticker is, why he's trading it, what the setup is. It needs to be something that's on my radar too. And it needs to be something where I can say right off the bat, I understand the reasoning here. And I can go into the trade with my own plan. And the second time I'll trade Tim's alerts is if it's a buy alert and I will try to scalp it really quick. Because having 2,000 followers does create a little short-term pop. And I do like to try to scalp that for a few cents a share every now and then. Uh, another problem a lot of you probably struggle with if you have small accounts is the pattern day trader rule. Early on what I did was I split my money between three brokers and that allowed me to have nine day trades every five business days. And that helped out. But I still would find myself in situations where I would be just about out of day trades in a broker and I'd enter a position and I'd say to myself, I don't want to get out of this. I want to save that day trade for something else. And you can't do that. You can never let yourself trade for any reasons other than the setup because I remember early on, one of my early successes, uh, summer of 2011, I had made $150 profit trading some breakout stock. And I was really excited because up to that point, it was my most profitable position. And it was the first real sign of success that I had. And the next day, I was almost out of day trades. The breakout was continuing. And I decided in the last 30 minutes of the day, I was going to try again. And I wanted to buy it. I wanted to hold overnight. I did not have the ability to sell at the end of the day. And because I couldn't get out of that trade, the stock tanked in the last 15 minutes of the day, went down about 10 cents a share on me, I think, gapped down the next morning, and I got stuck in a morning panic. I gave back my entire gain from the day before that I'd been so excited about. So early on, I did juggle those uh, three brokers. I did use that to get more day trades to help myself out. Once I finally hit the $25,000 account mark, which I think was about February of 2012, I took all the money and I merged it into one account. I went down to one broker. I chose the one broker that I was using the most at the time of the speed trader. And I decided to build out from there. So once I had that $25,000 in the account and I could trade freely, I started taking profits every week, every two weeks, and building up a new account after that. Another problem, like I said, I had the wrong brokers. I was with ShareBuilder, whoever the heck that is, early on. And I also had an E-Trade account. And I think right now the four best brokers out there for trading, what I trade at least with OTCs, are Speed Trader, Interactive Brokers, CenterPoint, and SureTrader. And I know there's a new one coming. I'm excited to hear about that. So that'll probably make the list too. Uh, Speed Trader, some of the things I love about Speed Trader is their flexibility for OTC traders. They offer a lot of OTC routes that you can go to. They're very good for early promotion buying. And they have a per trade basis, which is good for me because when I'm trading large position sizes, um, I'm just trading a flat, I'm paying a flat fee of $5.95 or $6.95 per trade. So costs really are down. The bad side of Speed Trader is if you're a short seller and you want to short sell these OTC pumps, you're not going to find the borrows there. I can think of maybe one OT stock I've seen borrows for on a major promotion there ever. And that was pretty much a fluke, I think. If you are looking to short sell, one that's a little bit better for you is Interactive Brokers, I think. Interactive brokers, uh, they do enforce the 250 rule, which makes it a little bit tough. You need to have a big account to take big numbers of shares. And they also don't offer level two for OTC stocks. So if you need a good trading platform and you need to be able to read level two, you're going to have to look elsewhere. But they do have very good borrows, and they're one of the few brokers that will allow you to potentially hold a borrow long term. A lot of brokers will cut you off after three days of holding. So if you're looking for a long term hold on a dying promotion or something like that, 
you can take a long-term position through them. I'm in a uh, position right now of WTER with Interactive Brokers. It's a long-term short, and I've been holding it for four or five days. Unfortunately, I'm down a little bit right now, but because I know that you can hold for a long period of time, I'm not really panicking, and I'm not thinking I have to cover this up immediately. There is still a risk. I get bought in on day six, day seven, something like that. But the way their borrows work is it's a first in, last out basis. So if people start getting bought in, I won't be one of the first to be bought in. My current favorite broker for OTC trading is Centerpoint. Uh, these guys replaced Capstone. And uh, they are fantastic. I think they're wonderful for buying and short selling. They can get a bit pricey. Uh, they do have ECN fees, uh, which is routing fees to different market makers. Usually comes out to about four tenths of a cent per share round trip. And that can get pricey if you're trading the really cheap stuff. So I really don't trade there unless the stock is over 50 cents or a dollar, something where I'm taking a smaller number of shares. Uh, one of the downsides of them is they do have a large account minimum. It's a goal to work up towards to be with them. But they have fantastic executions, and you really get what you pay for there, I think. And finally, SureTrader. Uh, I know that Tim talks about this one a lot. They started off better, at least for me, um, with my strategy in OTC trading. Recently, they've gone downhill a little bit, in my opinion. I don't think they're great for OTC traders right now. But they are nice because they can get you around the pattern day trader rule. So if you are a trader of NASDAQ stocks or stuff that's a little bit higher priced and you just don't have the $25,000 account, this very well could be a good fit for you. But they only offer four OTC routes. Executions of the routes are usually pretty shaky. I remember having a lot of frustrating trade experiences with them. And uh, I mean, they are cheaper routing fees, but again, that goes along with the uh, you get what you pay for mentality. So with OTCs, I can't necessarily recommend them especially because recently they're not letting you hold shorts overnight if it's under a dollar, and they have started enforcing the 250 rule. Another problem early on, and this is a problem I still struggle with, is emotional trading. Early on, it was a little bit different for me, though. The overwhelming early emotion for me was fear. And it would be the fear of possibly losing, the fear of being wrong. Uh, there was an adrenaline rush that would go along with entering a new trade. And I found that all that would just cloud my judgment. I couldn't keep a straight head on when I was in a trade. And as soon as the trade started to go against me, I would panic. And a great example of this is American Airlines, which I was trading recently. And American Airlines, as you can see here, it was consolidating for most of the day. And it had a morning spike up from 403 to 420. And I had gotten short into that move. And I was looking for a fade back later in the day. And so I was being patient. I was holding my short. And then midday, a press release came out that had to do with their merger talks. And that press release spiked the stock. And unfortunately, I was not in front of my computer immediately when this press release hit. I got in about minute two of the spiking when it was at 4.30, 4.35, something like that. So I was already down quite a bit on my share, or on my short. And in the old days, if I was panicking and if I was scared, I would have been covering into that spike. And as some of you may know, if you've had experience trading with OTC stocks, if you're trying to buy into strength, you're going to have a very hard time getting an execution. So I could have said at 435, I want to cut my loss, I want to get out. But in reality, I probably don't get executed until 445, 450, something like that, just because that's how the OTC market works. So instead, I managed to keep a level head here. I waited for the spike to top out. Could have averaged up. I decided not to because I was in a little bit bigger already than I wanted to. And I wound up covering into the ensuing pullback. I got covered in the high 430s. So it wasn't the best trade in the world. I still took a loss, but I managed to minimize the damage. Uh, a couple other solutions to help me with this emotional trading problem, with the fear. Uh, trading small. I don't know who had the quote, but the quote is, if you're scared, you're in too big. And there definitely is some truth to that. Early on, especially for me, I had that $1,500 that, to my name that I would trade with, and I was treating it like an all-in every time, basically. I was taking $1,500 positions. And I'm sure that's part of what caused me to be so scared and so skittish and have such a hard time focusing on the trading setup in front of me. And another thing I realized that really helped me out was when I would enter a position, one of the columns in most brokers that they'll show you is unrealized profit loss. So five minutes later, 10 minutes later, you can look at this position and you can see exactly how much you're up or how much you're down. And I realized along the way that seeing that number influenced how I acted. Because I would see myself up 100 bucks or down 100 bucks 
and I would say to myself, well, I don't want to lose that profit, or I don't want that loss to get worse. And all of a sudden, it would be about locking in that gain or locking in that loss, and I wasn't really thinking about what was happening in front of me and whether or not the trade was still going in my favor or whether the setup still was what I had looked for in the first place. So once I removed that column from my brokers, it really helped. In my head, sure, I still had a concept of how the trade was going, but it wasn't staring me right in the face. And that was just another thing for me that helped me make better level-headed decisions. One of my recent problems with emotional trading is greed and pride. And I've gotten a little spoiled through my success. Uh, I remember I took a couple big losses earlier this summer. I got stuck in the halt of BIZM. And uh, that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. And I said, what's happening here? I don't, I don't take big losses. That's not supposed to happen to me. And it turned a lot into a mental game for me of being too proud to take a loss or wanting to play damage control with the position rather than actually just cut the loss right away. And I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble like that over the summer especially. Uh, there was a period on the chart or of my profit chart where I've just been going sideways for two or three months. And that was not because it was slower necessarily because I was looking at my trades and my gains were still there. I was still making forty or fifty thousand dollars a month, but I would have way more losses in that month than usual. And a lot of that was because I was not willing to cut a loss. And I'm going to give you an example of that later uh, with NNRX. That one wasn't a loss for me, but it was a profit that I did a very good job of minimizing because I let emotions enter the equation. So these problems, especially with uh, emotional issues when you're trading, uh, you really can't just snap your fingers and fix it. It is something that also comes with time. But it helps to be self-aware. It helps to know what your problem is. You need to really be willing to examine yourself and know what you're struggling with, because that's how you start fixing it. And am I still working on this? Yes. But I've definitely had days and weeks where I've said to myself, I need to get back to my roots. I need to get back to doing what I was doing. Going And one final problem I had early on was overtrading. Uh, there were a couple different angles to this problem. One was that early on I didn't know who I was as a trader. And that's not necessarily bad. A lot of people are going to struggle with that early on. You need to figure out what setups work for you, what setups don't. So there's nothing wrong with not knowing who you are early on, but the problem I had is that I was still trading too big. I was taking too much size with these positions, not really knowing what the hell I was doing. So it's okay to learn early on, but trade smaller. Figure out what strategies work for you, figure out what your most consistent strategies are, and then focus in on those. And that's part of how I help my overtrading problem is I picked two setups that I loved. I loved new pump buys and I loved buying breakouts. And during this little climb back here on my profit chart from September and October and November, uh, I was just playing those two setups. I really narrowed my focus and I made sure that I was sticking to what I was good at. And then also I just was trying to do too, too much too soon. Um, one problem I struggled with early was boxing. And for those of you who don't know what the concept of boxing is, it's when you go short in one account and long in another account to lock up the shares to short, but you net out to no position. And then once you're willing to short sell for real, you sell the long half of the box. And mentally, I just couldn't handle this. About half of my early losses were from one position I was messing around with boxing because I couldn't handle the fact that I was up in one broker and down in the other. I wanted to be up in bro both brokers. So I started trying to scalp on the long side all, all kinds of uh, different positions. And I just took dumb loss after dumb loss after dumb loss. And it added up really fast. And to this day, I still can't box. I, I've tried it again with other major promotions. And I just managed to always screw it up. So again, that goes back to know yourself. Know what you can do. Know what you can't do. And I know that I'm done trying to box positions because it does not work for me. So I'm going to launch a little bit into my strategy here. And uh, a big part of my strategy with trading these pumps is know that pumper. And there are so many different stock promoters out there. And about 90% of them, at least, are not worth knowing. They will alert a stock. There'll be no volume. They'll alert a stock. It'll go straight down, whatever. What you need to figure out is who are the promoters worth following. And the way you do this is you save emails. You get on as many different email lists as you can and you track performance. You group different websites together. You figure out what promoters are related to each other. You basically have to figure out how does the market react to a promoter's alert. And I spent a lot of time early on doing this. I was fortunate enough to have help through some great traders in the Profitly chat room. I know Michael Good was a big help in this area. And uh, 
promoter history, it really can be used to help you make informed decisions. And I will give you my list of promoters right now also. I need to work on it a little more, complete it. But again, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to hook you up with the promoters that I'm currently following and the ones that I think are worth knowing. So I'm going to give you an example here of Know Thy Pumper and uh, just how you can use past history to help you make these informed decisions. And the promoter I'm going to be talking about is Brighton. And as you can see here, we have a ton of different websites from Brighton. They are a promoter with a lot of different domain names. And two of the most recent promotions are TALK and GNIN. And so one way I use Know Thy Promoter is I look at past charts and I say, what are these past picks done? So what do we know about Brighton? What have I gathered from them over the past two years? Well, they have a few different phases of promotion. The initial phase is boiler room activity. A lot of their websites, they give you an input to put your phone number in, and they actually call people and say, hey, you should buy this stock. It's the next big thing. I recently got on some of their phone call lists. And before their most recent pick, they were calling me, trying to convince me that they had picked a stock back in 2011 that went from $3 up to 30 or something like that. And it was kind of fun listening to that and knowing it was all a bunch of bullshit. But there are people out there who don't know this. And during this boiler room activity phase, what you usually see is a slow controlled climb. They really don't have big shakeouts with the picks. Uh, with GNIN, the biggest down day was, it looks like, nine cent, or eight cents on the day. With TALK, it was nine cents on the day down. They really didn't shake these that hard. They didn't do anything to scare people out. It just was slow and controlled upwards action. And for GNIN, it was about four weeks of boiler room activity. For TALK, about two weeks. So then phase two, they hit the emails. And with both of these with recent promotions, they would stagger their emails, which means I showed you that big list of websites of theirs. Well, they were sending out two to three different websites a day. And that is when the stock started to speed up. That is when it had the blow off top that led to the big collapse eventually. And every day, just after the market closed, they put out two or three emails on different new sites. And you get the big gap up and then continue action into the next day. And then, of course, phase three is the massive collapse phase. And with both the GNIN, TALK, and previous picks of theirs, their collapses are very brutal. They're very fast. And they're very choppy. They put in a lot of false bottoms where you think the stock is starting to bounce, and then they just stuff it, and it goes down to new lows. So that is what we know about Brighton. So let's talk about the most recent pick, NNRX. And NNRX is one where it was following form early on. They started with boiler room calls. I had gotten a call early on as well. I heard NNRX was the new pick. I loaded up on day one at 84 cents. And for the first week, a nice, slow, controlled climb. No big pullbacks. Biggest pullback attempt was on day five. It only went red on the day by a few cents a share. So everything was looking great, and we went into the weekend. And then over the weekend, after only one week of cold calling, emails hit. And they hit from all of the websites that had emailed me on TALK, or almost all of the websites. So they didn't stagger the emails. And so I figured, OK, all the emails hit. That's kind of weird. Not really their typical thing to do. But we should get a good gap up at least. Because with TALK, with GNIN, the emails led to gap ups. Well, not with NNRX. NNRX was a very, very weak gap up, only two cents a share. Uh, TALK, I remember with that one, when they first sent out their teaser emails, they had uh, put in the disclaimer that they were compensated for TALK, and they hadn't officially announced it. But even the presence of the ticker in their disclaimer had caused the stock to gap up 10 cents a share. And that was only from a few websites. So the fact that this wasn't gapping up, the fact that they had changed up their pattern, that told me something was wrong. And then it went into its big phase three tank. And as you can see, it again was a very choppy tank. A lot of false bottoms. We had one at a dollar. We had another one at 90 cents. I mean, I think it had put in something like six false bottoms on this day before it finally had any kind of bounce at all. And the NNRX example I wanted to talk about, where emotions got in the way and pride got in my way, uh, well, that was with my 84 cent trade. And I had gone into that trade wanting the next big home run pick, because every now and then, that happens to me. I go a while without a big gain, and I get a little antsy. And I start pushing, and I start trying to make something happen so that I can have the next big gain. And with NNRX, this was it in my mind. I knew I had gotten a good entry. I knew that TALK had gone to $2. I knew that GNIN had gone to $3. And so I had in my mind that everything was going to play out exactly the same. It was going to be a nice, drawn out, boiler room activity phase. And then we get the emails and we get the spiking and I could sell into that. And I was thinking, with that setup, I should make at least 50 grand. And I had that number in my head. Even though I try not to set price targets, even though I try just to take what the market will give me, I still had in the back of the mind, I want to make 50 grand on this pick. 
And so, even though I saw all those warning signs that day, and I knew that something was wrong, and that it was different, and they were changing things up, I only sold half my position. And there was a good five minutes that morning to sell out before things started to fall apart. And I still only took off half of my position. And the other half, I said to myself, even if they dip this, maybe they'll rebound it. Maybe they'll catch it. I'll just hold it. I turned the trade into a gamble. And even when they had the big tank from $1.40 down to $1, and I know what I know about Brighton promotion collapses, and the fact that there are these choppy collapses and they have a lot of fake bounces, I didn't take off into the first bounce. I still sat there and I still said, maybe they'll bring it back. Maybe they'll save it. And I was just so afraid of how stupid I would feel if I sold it early and if I left profits on the table that I let it wipe out the entire second half of that profit for me. I didn't get out until 83 cents, right below where I had bought in. So I still locked in some nice gains, but I left a lot of potential gains on the table because I was too stubborn and because I let my emotions get in the way. Could I have gotten out early in that first five minutes? Maybe I couldn't have gotten out the rest. I mean, volume, it was a little tough at that point. But I could have easily been out in that first bounce. And I didn't take it. So how do I find stocks? Um, well, I have a couple different methods. One is I just read my emails. And that's easy for me now because I have it organized by what promoters are good, what promoters are bad. And I know going into the day what tickers are being promoted, what might I want to buy, what might I want to short sell. And it's really as easy as that from the email front. As far as stock scanners go, that looks for the OTC stocks that aren't being so obviously promoted. And with OTC stocks, I'm drawn to volume. I like high volume, I like liquidity, it makes it easier for me to trade it. So I'll set up a couple different stock scanners. One of them, I'll scan for stocks that are the most active in the OTC market. And that just shows me the high volume movers, the ones that are bouncing around, maybe kind of volatile. The other scan I'll do is for the top percentage gainers in the OTC market. And that's because I have such little respect for OTC stocks that once you have a couple days in a row where one of these stocks is on the top percentage gainers, I start thinking about how I want to short sell it. And uh, with the top percentage gainers, I do put in a dollar volume minimum just because I don't want to find something that's traded 3,000 shares on the day and is up 1,000%. There's no way to trade that. You need to have volume to be able to trade these. So one of the... Uh, strategies that really got me going early on, I had a lot of my biggest gains early on, was buying new stock promotions. Back then, there were a few more promoters who were worthy of buying early. Right now, it really is mostly awesome penny stocks and victory mark. And they are pretty much one and the same. They were pumping different stocks for a while. They would do different promotions. Now, recently, it looks like they've merged up. They're pumping the same things. But what drew me to these guys is the fact that they trade very high volume. They're very, very volatile. And it's very easy to enter and exit these trades. And both of them had very similar ways that they would work. So I was drawn to the liquidity. I was drawn to the volatility. And recently, uh, they've made it a little bit easier on us. Instead of just randomly dropping picks on unannounced days, they give you warning emails. They say, our new pick is coming on this day. And then you can look for it at the bell, because usually they announce it right at the opening bell of the market. And again, with these, mainly at the level two action I use to time it. Uh, that's how I pick my exits. And I can thank Michael Good a lot for this strategy because he is the one who I learned it through. <laughs> so I'm going to go through a few recent uh, awesome penny stocks and victory mark promotions. The most recent being PCWT. And the way that they tip these off to us usually in the pre-market is they put down massive volume. You can see here between 9.30 and 9.20, it had already traded about at least 5 million shares. And with an OTC stock, it's pretty rare to find one that trades 5 million shares throughout the day. So if it's a day where there's a pick coming and there's a ticker trading 5 million shares pre-market, you can be pretty sure that's it. Sometimes I'll take these pre-market if I can get an entry, or sometimes I'll just buy them right upon confirmation at 9.30. But point being, I find these stocks on my scanner because it's most active, and I can have buy orders ready. I can be ready to go upon confirmation. And with PCWT, I bought it pretty early, sold it right into that first spike, was done with it. And the promotion did continue. It did get as high as 32 cents. This chart isn't completely up to date. But now it uh, had tanked as far down as 3 cents as of Thursday, and yesterday got halted after market close. XUII, another one, similar situation. Uh, early on in May, very beginning of May, the victory mark sites pumped this. I uh, can't, there we go. Right in there, that was the victory mark pump day. And it was still pretty high volume back then for it. I don't think I got a trade in that day. 
but this is the day Austin Penny Stocks came out on it too, and those websites joined the promotion. Again, it was just absolutely massive volume pre-market. It had traded 15, 20 million shares at least. I was on vacation during this pick, but I picked up on that volume pre-market, and again, bought into the confirmation, sold into the first spike. That was it. XUII, it went on, got as high as 75 cents before crashing. SWVI, another one, very similar situation. Uh, this had had a big volume day before its release, so there was a lot of speculation pre-market this was going to be the new pick. You can see it actually got driven up a little bit pre-market here uh, by speculators, but eventually got knocked back on huge volume again. You can see the volume pre-market here. Uh, millions of shares traded, and then got confirmed at 19 cents, had a big spike up into the high 20s. So another setup right there, it was absolutely perfect, traded it on confirmation, got out into the spike. Eventually, SWVI went as high as a dollar. So one question you might be asking is, these promotions do tend to continue. Why do I sell into the first spike? Why do I take those profits when SWVI could have held those shares to a dollar? And the answer is because it's not always that easy. And because these guys do have a large number of promotions where they either burn their subscriber base or the promotion just straight up fails. So what I mean by a failed promotion is usually it gets announced, it's a one-day promo, and then it's followed by a massive, massive tank. And it makes this buy and hold approach very risky. And it turns it into a gamble, which is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. I want to take the consistent, reliable profits, and I don't want to be sitting there playing guessing games about whether or not they're going to stick with the promotion or not. These guys are in complete control. They control all the shares. It's in their hands whether they're going to continue the promotion or not. It's completely up to them. So don't play guessing games because nobody knows but them. And I'm going to show you some of the failed ones now. RIRS, uh, this is one of the first ones, and this is really the pick that kind of changed the game, because this is the first time they really burned everybody. And RIRS, that was the debut of the Victory Mark websites. Everybody assumed they were tied to awesome penny stocks. And as you can see, had a good day one. Got announced at about 35 cents, got as high as high 50s. And then overnight, awesome penny stocks, people were thinking they'd jump in on the promotion. Nope, awesome penny stocks emails out, says, SNPK is still our pick, whatever their previous ticker was. And as you can see, the next day, we got a giant gap down, followed by tank, and it was just straight liquidation for three days, down under a dime. And I know a lot of people got clipped by that one. The LNX, another one, awesome penny stocks, uh, took a few months off, had their big return pick, everybody was really excited. Had the big morning spike from 15 cents up into the 30s, got as high as high 30s. It looked great. It really looked like a healthy promotion. Everybody thought this was going to be the next big one. There was really no reason for them to cancel this. But for whatever reason, overnight, they just didn't send out emails. They didn't do any kind of follow-up. And as a result, the next day, had the gap down, had the giant tank. And that was a really crazy one-day tank because it got under five cents, I believe, all in one day. SLIO, uh, this is a Victory Mark promotion. Had the morning spike, consolidated a little bit. Victory Mark sent out emails saying we're canceling our pick. And of course, after that, nothing but down. ACCS, uh, this one just straight up failed. There was no cancellation that I know of. I only have the morning part of the intraday chart here. But you can see we had another morning spike here, the pre-market volume. Uh, spiked from 14 up to about 19, I believe. Then consolidated for a while. Eventually, that 14 cent low cracked. And we had a one-day tank all the way down into the Five cent area again, I think. HIDC, this was just a crappy promotion that failed. It was Victory Mark again, I believe. Same thing. Awesome pre market volume tipped you off to this being the pick. Spiked from 1.6 cents up into the four cent range, I think. Great green day on day one, but then just no follow up after that. They kept on emailing, but they just couldn't get any more volume to the stock, couldn't get enough buyers, I guess, and slowly faded off over the next week. And finally, PWEI, this is one of the more recent awesome penny stocks promotions. It was a repump, actually. Victory Market originally done PWEI a year ago or so. And awesome penny stocks jumped in on it, said PWEI is our new pick. Had the pre-market volume again, tipped me off. Had this nice morning spike to sell into. Climbed a little more for a couple of days, and then it got halted. So that's another thing we have to be careful of now, is that lately we're getting a lot more SEC halts on these uh, pump and dumps than we used to. So it makes the risk of holding overnight even greater. So what's my point with all of these? Why am I showing you these failed promotions? Is because it doesn't have to be a gamble. It doesn't have to be risky. All of these trades behind me are trades that I made on these promotions, the ones that failed. It's just shy of $40,000 in profits. 
And these are from some of the most violent, horrible promotions that have ever been done. The ones that have just been absolute bloodbaths. And I made just shy of $40,000 on them because that initial spike is there. That chance to take profits is there, and I take them. I don't turn it into a gamble. I don't put myself in a situation where I'm going to wake up the next day down 50%. I also like to short promotions. And what I look for when I'm shorting the promotions is generally I'm looking for overextended charts. And when I get these overextended charts, I'm looking for one of two things. I'm looking for either a big morning spike to short into, or I'm looking for a green to red move. And the green to red move, of course, Tim talks about that a lot. And that's just the snap and momentum on an overextended chart, usually followed by a big tank. And so whether it's the spike, whether it's the green red move, I want to be covering into the pullback, and uh, especially if it's a full-blown collapse. When you're shorting into the spikes, especially, you have to be a little more careful because you know sometimes these do surprise you. They do hold up. They do go longer than you expect. And if you're too stubborn to cover into the pullback, you open the door to it ramping back up on you and letting yourself get squeezed. Again, level two is key to my timing on these. That's how I time my tops, especially into spikes. And that's how I know when I should get short or when I should cover up. So here's some examples of overextended charts. First, of course, is Fannie Mae. And this isn't from the May run-up. This is from the March run-up. This is what got it going initially. You can see on the daily chart here, three huge green days in a row, from 30 cents up to about 75. So my plan going into that day with that overextended chart, like I just said, either wanted to short a green to red move or I wanted to short a big morning spike. Well, we got the big morning spike. Gapped up to 80 cents, spiked up into the 90s. But the pullback really wasn't all that hard or all that violent. I don't remember if I traded this one or not specifically, but into that pullback, uh, when you see it's not falling apart, when you see it's not tanking, uh, that's where you need to be getting covered up. You need to be taking the small gains. And I do take a lot of small gains. A lot of times, these morning spikes, they don't turn into collapses for me. But I still have the pullback opportunity, and I take it. May, uh, Fannie Mae did something very similar had broken out, had gone from 150 up to about three. I was thinking same thing, gap up, spike, and I want to shorten to the spike or I want to shorten to a collapse. And we got the morning spike here, gapped up to 350, spiked up to four, or maybe it was more like 390. But point being, I got shortened to this one. I remember trading this one very specifically. I shorted this almost perfectly at the top. I think it was about 382. And then we got the big crack and we got the big pullback. And this was a nice violent pullback, very, very textbook level two action. And it started to catch here around the low of the day. So I covered up. I covered up because it was not cracking. The panic was not continuing. And it's a great thing I did because Fannie Mae did have another day, had a blow off top to over $5. Had I been stubborn and held that, I could have gotten myself into a lot of trouble. Examples that aren't quite as clear cut as Fannie Mae, uh, WTR is a good one. This was one that had had six up days in a row, I believe, coming into the day. I was looking for the same thing as usual. Turns out we got a nice morning spike, gapped up to about $1.12, spiked into the 130s, and there you go, you got the big pullback on it again. But once again, it held up, it didn't fully collapse. So now let's talk about days where it did work. And here's the Fannie Mae tank day in March. In this case, the chart is now even more overextended. It had closed over a dollar the day before. We got our slight gap up, we got our morning spike, and then it just turned into a complete disaster. Tanked all the way down to 55 cents. And this is a case where I made a little bit of a mistake on this one. When shorting into these spikes, you do have to be careful to mind your size. You need to go in with a plan on shorting those because it can be dangerous and you can mistime it. Fannie Mae, it was tricky. I timed with level two, yes, but level two isn't always clear cut. It always isn't always perfect. The problem I had that day was the fact that Fannie Mae it had a little bit of a morning spike maybe got halfway there to its top eventually, and then it started to look like it was topping on the level two action. So what I decided to do is I decided I was gonna short right then, and I went in big. And then it caught itself and it kept on spiking. And that was an oh shit moment for me, because I don't know how much more this is gonna spike. I don't know if the pullback is gonna be a full collapse that day. It could have been like the day before, it was just a gentle little six cent pullback and then it just ramped up and continued. And I was in too much size to play the average up game. So I had to try to manage this position and stay patient. It worked out for me. It did tank. I did have a nice gain on it. But I really minimized the opportunity because I had started in too early with too much size. So when you're shorting into these spikes, you really need to know going in, what is your plan? Is your plan to average in on a spike? If so, don't go full size immediately. You need to work your way in. Maybe start with a quarter position, a half position, whatever. 
And that's if you want to be stubborn and you don't want to cover if it keeps on squeezing. Or you could take the approach I took the second time in May, which is if you try shorting into a spike and it turns out it's a fake top, just cover up immediately. On this day for Fannie Mae, on this collapse day, this was my big day. And we got the nice morning spike here, but in this morning spike, there were two or three fake tops on the level two. And when I got short into these fake tops, the stock would top out a little bit, pull back maybe two cents, and then the bid would solidify, it would catch itself, and it would continue on upwards. And as soon as I saw that happening, as, saw, as soon as I saw the bid catching and it was clear that, that was not the real pullback, I covered up. I just got out. And that's the other way to trade it, because that way you're just, you get to start over. You take a small loss. I was willing to take two to three cent a share losses on this, because I knew that when it did eventually crack, it, whether it was a big panic or not, I mean, I figured like the day before, I was going to get at least a 30 or 40 cent a share pullback. So that makes a few two to three cent a share losses worth it. And for me, the way I trade, that was a little easier for me than averaging up. I decided I would just take off every time it was starting to go against me again. And eventually, I got my size in, I nailed the top up in the 520s, and things started to collapse, and it turned into a full-blown panic for me. Another example here is W. Um, an example of shorting when it's not a morning spike, WTER. Uh, so this is the day after the last WTER slide I showed you. Again, same thing, seven up days in a row. You know this is going to crack eventually, and when it does crack, it should be a nice panic. This didn't really give us a morning spike that day, though. It gapped up a couple cents a share, sure, but you know, two or three cents a share there, that's really not a spike. That's just a little bit of a grind. And all day, you know, it had the first pullback here, it held, red -green, or it held green red, and then it just grinded all day. And none of this is really spiking action. I think you can see, I hope you can see the difference here. This is just a grind. And later in the day when it did start to crack and it did get below that 115 mark, that's when I struck. And so I got short on the crack of green to red and we got the big panic that we expect. One final example here for you is FARE. And you might think this one's a little bit weird given the time of uh, the chart it was at. But you know, it doesn't have to be a stock at all time highs for me to consider it to be overextended. FARE, this is an old Dawson Penny stocks pump. It had you know, run to 30 cents, had its big tank, just a bunch of massive down days in a row. Eventually bottomed out at 3 cents. And then right in here in two days went from 3 cents up to 11 cents. So about a 300% move. And right then I'm saying, okay, this looks overextended to me. So I apply the same rules I would apply to Fannie Mae or to WTR or to any other overextended stock to it. And I look the next morning for a morning spike to short into, or for cracking action. And as it turns out, we got the morning spike. And one of the level two videos I'm going to share with you is video I took on FARE on this spike. And unfortunately, I couldn't find shares to short. It would have been a home run trade if I had. But we got the nice spike up to 16, so it went up to about a 500% move off the lows. And then got the crack. First crack was down to the low of the day, caught itself, had a little fake bounce and then eventually plummeted even more down to $0.08. Cents. So that's 50% off the highs. One final setup I want to talk about is D-list promotions. And what I mean by D-list promotions is a lot of times these are the guys who you don't want to be buying. These are the guys who they'll announce a new pick, it'll maybe go up for a minute or two, and then it just does nothing but go down. So my strategy with these guys, I've identified the D-list promoters that can draw enough volume to make them worth trading. And in the rare event that they are shortable, I like to shorten the little spike they produce, or I like to short just into the full-blown collapse. What you need to distinguish between on these D-list promotions is whether or not the promoter was compensated or uncompensated. If the promoter shows in the disclaimer that they were compensated, what that means is someone hired them to pump this stock, which means somebody has shares to dump. So if you have these promoters who are really crappy to begin with, and then you have some outside party who's dumping shares into it also, it's not going to do very well. It's destined to fail. The uncompensated promotions are the ones you have to be a little more careful with because these are promotions that the promoters do to build their lists. Usually they find low float tickers out there that will spike very dramatically upon announcement because there is nobody dumping shares into it. And then they can say they had the big pick that went from three cents up to a dollar in one day. And those spikes you have to be a little more careful with, but I like shorting into those spikes too if it's shortable because they can have some pretty violent, pretty quick downside. 
But again, this is a situation where you need to pay yourself into pullbacks. Uh, I really am not too patient with these because, in all honesty, when I've tried to be patient with these before, it hasn't worked out for me because these will catch sometimes, they will rebound. And every now and then you'll have a rare promotion from these guys where it does run two or three days. So I just try not to put myself in a situation where I'll get squeezed and I like to take the quick, easy profits. So a couple of examples of these. One would be NHLI. NHLI is a good example of one that I screwed up. I believe this was an uncompensated promotion. I can't remember. But, you know, had the morning spike here from about $0.08 cents up into the 30s. Or the, was it even the 40s? I can't see the lighting there. But point is, had a big morning spike. And I got short into the spike. I timed it kind of wrong, though. I started in too early. And luckily, I hadn't started in with full size. I gave myself a chance to average up because I knew when the pullback came, it would be a big pullback. I wound up short 100,000 shares at a 30 cent average. And we got the nice pullback here. We got the crack. Went down to about 23, I think. I was sitting on six or seven thousand dollars of unrealized profits. And I didn't lock it in because that wasn't enough of a pullback for me. I was stubborn. I said, I want this to go down more. I want this back down to 15 cents. This thing's a piece of shit. But instead, it grinded back all day and it made me nervous. And I wound up having to cover most of it break even because I didn't know if this was going to be the next one that ran for two or three days. So I had to play safe. I had to cover up into this little rebound. And I did a great job of minimizing my profits. Fortunately for me, I did manage to nail it on this day, the big down day. But again, I just screwed up the first time. I didn't follow my rules. I didn't take off into the pullback. PLLX, I don't think this one was shortable, but it's a good example. Um, again, you get the dealer's promotion on it. Has this big spike in two or three minutes, and it's over. That's it. That's all it can sustain. And then you get the nice big pullback that follows it. And then this one even had a nice bounce. It had another second shorting opportunity. So basically, with these things, the mentality for me is shorten the spikes, cover into pullbacks. And even if I don't hit the whole trade, I still catch the meat of the move. One thing I've done along the way as a trader that's really helped me is I've accepted the fact I'm not going to catch the whole move. I've accepted the fact I'm going to leave profits on the table. And I know that that's what a lot of great traders do. One final example, and uh, this one still kind of hurts me to this day, GCIH. Uh, this one, this one was a huge spike up into the dollar range. And I remember uh, this one was shortable, but the day I was looking for it, I typed in GCIN instead of GCIH. So I didn't know it was shortable. And uh, I think I found out right about in here that I had missed a short. So as you can see, this was just a textbook short. Um, again, I would have just shorted into the spiking. I would have been comfortable building into a position along the way. And then when we get the big pullback into the 50 cent range or even down here into the 40 cent range or whatever it was, uh, that's where you're taking off. So this one uh, would have been a great short, would have been a home run trade, but unfortunately I screwed up, I missed it. And uh, as you can see on the daily chart, really nothing else to it. Um, it did hold up throughout that day, but even the next day it had some massive tanking. So these things rarely hold up for a while, um, but I still pay myself into pullbacks just on the off chance that I do come across the one that does. So that really covers the main stuff I wanted to talk to you guys about, and I'll take any questions you might have now. Yes? Passing the mic around. Testing. Next question. On Fannie Mae, you had said that you cut it right off because you mistimed it. When you did catch it, did, you, did it go against you at all, or did you catch it as it had rolled over and started going down? Uh, we're talking about the day in March? Yes. The way I believe I played this was, like I said, I had, I had started in short somewhere in here, probably around, I think around here on the chart, it looks like it might have big topped a little bit. And so that's where I started into my short, but I took way too much size. So I might have wound up adding a little bit up at the top, I can't remember exactly, but the point is that I was already in way too much size at that point, so I couldn't, I, I couldn't hit the true top. And yes, the pullback, you know, worked out for me. It did turn into a massive tank. But at that point, it kind of turned into a mentality of playing for break even for me. So it just completely shifted my thoughts on the trade because I knew I put myself in a bad situation. Right there. <laughs> Tough job. Hey, thank you. Hi, TV boy. I got a question. I can see you, then you always are looking for the shorts. Mm -hmm. 
Now you can, my guess is that you can see when they're going to spike too, right? Um, can you get the microphone a little closer? Like, probably you can see when they're going to be spiking too, right? You can see the movement, the pattern, they're going to spike. But if you don't take any long positions first, then to lick it at the top, and then take the shorts down, you just... Oh, about like, the long position? Like I don't take the long side too much, you're yeah. asking? Um, it depends on the situation and how comfortable I am. With with charts like this, when it starts to get overextended already, and I know it's had a bunch of updates in a row, it's a lot harder for me to want to buy into it because I know that pullback is due. And it doesn't always work out like this where it is a big gap up and spike. Sometimes, you know, you get a chart like this where it's a few straight days up, and then instead it gaps down the next day. So I, I try not to put myself in situations where I'm long overnight on an overextended chart just because there is no guarantee that the next morning you're going to have a chance to sell out for a profit. Hello? Uh, yeah, that makes sense what you're saying. But in the, can you make, you know, a 20, 15% profit in one day and don't wait, you know, for the night? Just, just, just cover it with that 10 or 15% uh, gain. Yeah, I, I think I get what you're asking. Um, I mean, like I said, I don't really like to overnight these when they're overextended, but intraday I will trade them still sometimes on the long side. But it's kind of opposite mentality on those where, let's see if I can find a different chart here. I'll be, I'll be buying the pullback. So instead of shorting the spike, I'm buying the pullback, sort of like when I would cover. So in this case with Fannie Mae, um, on this big morning pull here where I covered up, I very well could have also gone long. I can't remember now off the top of my head. But I do judge that off of the level two action. And if I see, if I see bottoming action, especially in a case like this where it's right at a key support point on the chart, if I see bottoming action, I'm likely going to buy some in really quick. And then I'll just let the level two guide me after that. And if it looks like it's going to top out really fast, I just try to get out. But buying bounces on these can be risky because in the, uh, oh, which example was it? In the FARE example, you can see here, like that's, that's a very similar chart, but in this case, it did keep on going down. This stuffed the bounce. So, I mean, I'll, I'll trade them on the long side every now and then, but just because I know that it's overextended and the possibility that big tank is there, I'm a lot more careful with it on the long side. Thank you very much. Sure. Right there. Yeah. Uh, same row right there. This is my job. What's up? Who has a question? No, I think around the same time, uh, uh, the real, there were a lot, of, a lot of news on real estate market picking up and so forth, and you know, Fannie Mae was picking up, and so I, I, I was not even interested because I thought, wow, that thing could go forever. So I'm just kind of curious your, you know, how you found it and, and your mentality around that. Sure. Um, well, let's get back to a Fannie Mae chart here. Back in March originally, are you asking yeah, about? Back, back, okay. back in March. Well, back in March, um, I showed you these three big days in a row here up. This is a daily chart. So you can see here on this first day, we had massive volume and we had a big gain. So that was one that my top percent gainers would have picked up. And that put it on my radar initially, and then since it was such crazy volume for an OTC stock, I think I just put it on my watch list and was watching it every day after that. And uh, just as a follow-up question, so your Mar the March trades that you made and watching it really set you up for the May win, right? At that point, you, you, you felt like you knew that, that, that stock pretty well, at least its behavior. Mm -hmm, right, yeah. I, the March trades really set me up for May, definitely, because I remembered... When, when I was trading it that day in May into that spike, I remembered how it had put in a couple fake tops on me in March, and how I had kind of gotten a little underwater on my short position, and how uncomfortable that had made me, and how much it affected my trading decisions. So when the day came in May where it was giving me a second chance, I said to myself, I'm not going to do that again, and this time I'm just going to take losses really fast, because that way when it comes time for the real trade, I can go in with a clean slate. Uh, right behind you, yeah. What route did you use on uh, Fannie Mae? Fannie Mae, I was trading that one through Centerpoint, and that was the Citadel route. Market Maker would show up, I think, as CDEL. And that, yeah, that was also something I learned along the way through trading it. Not even necessarily on any of these big days, but just through scalping it here and there. Um, I learned that that route was giving me a lot better executions for whatever reason than NITE was or ATDF or any other routes. So that's another part I guess I didn't really talk about, but it's a big part of my trading is with these OTC stocks, since executions are so sketchy, I really did spend a lot of time, especially early on, experimenting with different routes, figuring out what worked in what situation, 
and using that to my advantage. Because speedy executions and having the confidence, if you're trying to play a bounce and you don't know if it's a fake bounce or not, the confidence that you can get out of your position is huge. The, um, when you picked your, your fake top, or when you keep your eyes open for it, what percent pullback or, or rise do you kind of set in your head, percent of the equity? Well, do, do you have like a number in your head? It's, it might be a gut feeling, yeah. but if we were to kind of set filters for our screens. Oh, oh like for the scanners? Yes. What we're looking for? Um, well, I guess the way it really works for me is I'm looking at the price action compared to previous price action. So it's not so much about a set percentage number, but if you have a stock like Fannie Mae in this case where it's traded sideways for months with nothing really happening. And then all of a sudden it has this big day. I mean, this day was only maybe 20 or 30% up on the day as a first day, but it was so big relative to prior price action. So it's really what is the chart doing prior to what it has done before. So it's really unique in each case. But when I'm using my scanner, I believe I have it set to find me OCC stocks that have traded at least $100,000 in volume and are up at least 10% on the day or something like that. And a lot of times I'll find stocks on the scanner and I'll look at the chart and I'll say, I don't have no interest in this. Yeah, like, but when it's, uh, when it's on the decline, when you're in the, uh, in the short position, when it's going to do a fake top, that's when you say, it's cut my losses. That's Oh, the fake top. Yeah, I, uh, well, when I think about cutting losses, when I think about even like booking gains, I'm not thinking in terms of percentages really. I, I really am just trading off the level two, to be completely honest. It has to do, because I don't, I don't know at that point. I don't know if, you know, if the stock on that March day spikes to a dollar, tops out, pulls back two cents, and then starts to spike through a dollar again. I don't know if that's going to a buck 20. I don't know if that's going to a buck 10. I don't really know how strong the squeeze is going to be. So I'm just using the level two to show me and tell me what it's going to do. And once, once the level two starts to get heavy again and it looks like it's going to pull back again, that's when I would give it a second try. So I'd say, I'd say really it's more about it being in a situation where I expect there to be a pullback because it just had topping action. And when I'm not getting that pullback uh, and it's starting to go to new highs especially, I just take off. And if I can get off quickly within, in this case it was within a couple cents a share, where it's not like I'm chasing a spike, but I'm out pretty quickly, I'm okay with that. But if it turns into a situation where I just couldn't get the execution and it keeps on spiking without me, then I start thinking more in terms of, okay, I'll get my position average up. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, can you pass the microphone up front here? Yeah, so I know you uh, bring up level two a lot. So what indicators in level two actually trigger you to sell or cover? Is it just mass amounts of loading on the bid? You know, you're just talking about uh, the ass getting heavy. Um, is that just mass amounts of sellers there that you see? or? Uh, that's a little difficult to explain without a visual. Um, if you shoot me an email for the videos on level two, I will, I mean, I'll definitely explain it in there and talk about what I'm looking at. Um, I'll try to explain it now a little bit, I guess, but when you have a stock that's spiking like Fannie Mae, what you usually see is tons of market makers stacked up on the bid side, and then the ask is very thin. There's maybe one or two market makers at each price level, if that. So what I look for is a few things. I look for the ask to start soaking size. And what I mean by that is you have those two market makers sitting on the ask, and in the time and sales box, there's just green print after green print hitting the ask there, but those market makers aren't lifting. So they have hidden size, they're selling a lot. So that's kind of the first thing I look to see. Then I look for more market, acres, mar market makers to start stacking up on the ask. So instead of two market makers on the ask, suddenly a third comes in, a fourth, a fifth. It starts to kind of shift in that direction. And then, of course, the bid will thin out. So instead of having eight market makers on the bid like you did before, it starts to thin out down to six, five, four. So it's really when it starts to turn like that. That turning action is what I look for. And with Fannie Mae, that was a great one because it was so liquid and that was such clear action. And the more liquid the stock, usually the more clear the turns are. Question from uh, live stream. Oh, sure. Um, 
Have you ever experimented with basic options, puts or calls as hedges? No, I've never traded options. Uh, it's something I might try to learn down the road, but so far I just have stuck with OTCs. Cool. Uh, one other question, or two more questions. Um, do you have any recommendations for maximizing the number of borrows that you get? Um, well, I would say having multiple brokers helps. That's really what has helped me in some cases where interactive brokers would have a short that sure trader didn't. Um, one thing I kind of passed over by accident on my center point slide was the fact that center point actually allows you to enable locates if an active broker has them and they don't. So that's one of the reasons also that center point is one of my favorite places for borrows because even if you can't get it right away from, you know, if it's not easy to borrow at the beginning of the day, you still have a couple other options to get the locate. Cool. Uh, what books do you suggest reading? Uh, Tim's book. Yeah. Other than that, I really did not read any books. Uh, which route do you use when uh, you're, you're buying uh, APS first day pump? It varies. Um, there have been different routes that have worked with mixed success over the past year. Uh, for a while it was SUNR, but recently that one really hasn't filled too well for me. Recently FANC, that's filled a lot better for me lately. Um, but half of it is looking to see what market makers are on the ask and if you have the ability to route there or not. Uh, we have yeah, one up front here. Can you define your terms tops off and finds a bottom? Uh, sure. I guess just what I mean by tops off is when it actually does put in its true top. So, or do you mean like even in the fake out situations? Oh, okay. Yeah, I use mostly level two for that. So, you know, in a chart like Fannie Mae where it's just extending up to the sky and you really have nothing else to base it off of, no points on the chart. I'm really using level two to tell me what's going on, and I'm just following the price action. And then same thing on the pullbacks. I'll I'll look in like on the, when the stock is pulling back, I will use level two in combination with the chart. So I will pay attention to the level two, especially in a case like this. If if this had pulled back towards the low of the day, low of the day is somewhere where I'd expect there to be support. So if I start to see bottoming action near the low of the day, that's where I'd get a little more confident about buying. Volume. Um, Kind of like I said, is there like a minimum volume I look for? Is that what you're asking? Um, not so much. I, I guess maybe on bounce plays on bottoms. Um, Fannie Mae, let's see if I can find the May collapse chart here. One thing you'll notice on Fannie Mae on the tank day here in May, it was a very similar tank to what it was in March. And even in March, the March example, um, you can see how massive the volume was right down here, right when it bottomed. And that was something I remembered in May when I was playing the bounce and on the long side for that play. So in May when it was giving us the same thing, it put in all this volume down here. Um, first of all, the level two looked great, like it was starting to bottom out. And then also the fact that the volume was so high, I was pretty confident that it was a bottom just like it had been in March. Um, hey, uh, so I got a question about your NNRX trade. Oh, sure. So originally you said you um, didn't really stick to your strategy because that was your home run you know, shot. Mm -hmm, right. Uh, my question is, if you stuck to your strategy, would you have traded beforehand, like on Friday or over the weekend? And if so, what indicator would have told you, like, hey, I need to get out over the weekend, or hey, I should get out Friday at, you know, 3.59? Um, well, the strategy basically was completely centered around information I had about Brighton and how they'd behaved in the past. So okay. when it was in that early slow platform phase, um, I mean, if I hadn't gotten an early position, maybe I would have bought it and held it over the weekend because I still was thinking that it had room to go up. I was thinking they would stagger the emails like they had before, and I really did think it would be another week or two till emails even started hitting. So if I was just taking a position for the first time, it would have, you know, it would have felt like a chase to me, and I probably would have gone smaller, but I would have definitely been entering it based off of the fact that emails hadn't even hit yet. But it was... Uh, it was that once those emails hit and they were all at once and they didn't have any kind of morning strength because of those emails, that was when it kind of became clear that I had to break away from my strategy because it was, it was different from what I had seen in the past. And I mean, yes, using past pumps is a good guideline and it, it helps you make better decisions. 
but you also have to keep in mind that each pump is its own unique thing. So yeah. it, uh, it, it, that one behaved by its own rules. And when it, when it split off from what I was familiar with, it was all gambling from that point on. Thank you. Sure. Uh, over to your left there. How do you go about finding the stocks and watching the stocks uh, before they peak? Um, are you talking about buying? What? Are you talking about me buying specifically? Yes, how do I? How, what charts do you watch to go to be going up, and how do you how do you find those? Well, again, the main I, I have my usual ones that I stick to, like the emails from the promoters, and then the ones that my scanner picks up. Um, there are only a few situations I'm really comfortable buying in. One that I talked about was the new promotion buying. So that just isn't the case where I know the promoter has a history of producing good spikes upon their announcement. So I will, I will buy when they send out the email saying what their new pick is. If it's the case where it's off of my scanner, usually if it's on my top percent gainers, I feel like it's up too much already for me to buy. But in that case, I'd either be looking for pullbacks to buy in on, or I'd be looking for the chart to develop a little bit and set up a breakout level. Do you have a promoter that you would recommend? I like the Awesome Penny Stocks group and the Victory Mark group. Um, for early buying, let's see. A lot of the others are struggling lately, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint off the top of my head which other ones are good right now. Especially for the initial spikes, because a lot of these guys, I, I really don't like holding these guys overnight on the long side. It's just so risky to be along a pump these days. Um, we've seen more halts this year than I'd seen in the past two years of my trading combined. So um, if you email me from my promoters list, I, I have it broken down between, you know, I have a tab for good promoters, a tab for bad promoters, and, you know, the ones I look to buy, the ones I look to short. And I'll have, I'll have notes next to each promoter specifically, so you can get some more detailed thoughts on them. But that will have a complete list of the guys who I recommend you be on their mailing lists. Anything further, guys? The live stream was, oh, okay. um, do you have any quest, um, lessons for a newbie? Any lessons for a newbie? Um, well, definitely uh, read my 10 trading tips posts that I gave for Tim Sykes. And just really a lot of the stuff I talked about early with controlling your emotions and some of the stuff I struggled with early. Um, let me get back to that slide for you here. Yeah, so a lot of these things is what I struggled with early. I'd just say, um, especially if you're new, trade small early because a lot of these mistakes, they get amplified so much if you're trading size. Um, if I had been trading anything bigger than $1,500 positions early on, there is a good chance I wouldn't be standing here right now because I would have taken myself out of the game. Um, I was, I mean, I was down $1,300 early and I was trading $1,500 of my money. I was fortunate that I had worked a summer job that year and I had a little more capital to refund with because if I, if I had refunded, you know, that summer and said, okay, well, instead of trading $1,500 positions, I'm going to put it all in my account right now and trade five grand. I mean, then this $1,300 of losses in the fall would have been $4,000 of losses. I would have had no money to go to to help me, and I'd be done. So definitely just keep your size small early on. Don't let your early mistakes take you out of the game because there will be early mistakes. Two final questions from moi. Um, number one, you had obviously a great run up with your, your profits and you've had great success. Uh, but a few weeks ago, you had a, a little stumble. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that. What led to it? Uh, what did you do for the, the week that you took off? And how did you overcome it? Oh, OK, yeah. I, are you talking about SOUL or BIZM? Your time, your week off from trading. Oh, when I was in Colorado? Yeah. Well, a lot of that was just because I was traveling with my beautiful girlfriend. But Ooh, good answer. <laughs> yes. Um, but no, I did need a break. Every now and then, I do start feeling a little mentally burned out on trading. And I mean, it's a stressful job. Every day you're doing it, and it does kind of compound itself after a while. So it is good to walk away every now and then. But um, the early stumbles, and I, I did this back last September, too, uh, right around the time of the Maldives, actually, because I went to Thailand after that, and I went two weeks without trading in Thailand and came back feeling very refreshed. But it usually comes from when I 
go a while without any kind of big gain, the market slows down maybe, and I start pressing a little bit, trying to make things happen. Um, right before Colorado, I was messing around with a pump, SOUL. That was an uh, overextended chart setup. It had gone up from something like 20 cents to a dollar or something like that. And that one, instead of following my rules and shorting into spikes, every time it started to look a little weak, I started shorting into the weakness. And I let myself get trapped a few times. And then they would support the stock, they would spike it back, I'd have to cover for a loss. So I just made a lot of really sloppy trades on SOUL because I was, and I was trading way too much size too, because I wanted SOUL to be my collapse from a dollar to 50 cents and be a nice ten to fifteen thousand dollar gainer. And instead I took five or ten thousand dollars of losses on it because I was trying to force trades before the setup was right. Uh, before that, and this kind of led to me pushing on SOUL a little bit, I got stuck in the BIZM halt. And I, I mean, that was really sort of something that was a little more out of my hands. Maybe that's why, part of why I'm a little so skittish about holding overnight on pumps now. But BIZM, for those of you who aren't familiar with that one, that was a promotion that went up from a dollar to four dollars in a few weeks and then pulled back, was consolidating in the two dollar or three dollar area. I tried to take an overnight position at three something and the night I was overnight it happened to get halted and I took a twenty thousand dollar loss. So, um, I mean I, I clawed out of that hole pretty quickly. I think I had a couple good weeks right after that but I still was kind of mentally shaken from that and saying well I still sent myself back twenty thousand dollars I want to make that back quickly. I need, I need a nice big trade to, you know, get my chart going up again. And so it, it really just, that goes along with the emotional side of things. I, I stopped thinking so much about the trade setups in front of me and I started thinking about my own personal goals. Cool. And uh, last question, compare your life like two years ago, you know, poor ass Tim Grittani versus, you know, I wouldn't say like very wealthy, but, but well on his way and, and close to being a millionaire. Like what is, what's changed in your life? Are you still humble? What's your perspective on all this? Um, I mean, I feel very fortunate to have basically even been, had the opportunity to do any of this. Um, I can't say I live all that differently now than I did a couple of years ago. I do have a little more opportunity as far as uh, freedom of my choices goes. I. I mean, I started trading, I found success, I was able to move into an apartment with my best friend rather than, you know, look for a job back home. I, I went from the Chicago area to Columbus, Ohio, basically just on a whim because I wanted to be somewhere new and I wanted to live with a buddy. So the freedom on that end is very nice, but still, I mean, it's, you know, cheap apartment, nothing too crazy. Um, so I'd like to think I've kept a decent head on my shoulders. Good, good man. Uh, one last question. Do you talk about it with your friends and like your your family and your girlfriend like when you make you know two hundred thousand in a day or you just like because I I've, I've experienced this like you don't know I mean you make literally someone's like five years of salary in one day mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with that um, usually I'll just say I had a good day or I had a bad day and I leave it at that I, I don't really jump into numbers or anything like that so if you make two hundred thousand a day or like twenty thousand in a day it's the same I had a good day. Pretty much, yeah, or a really good day. I think I, I, I might have gone as far as to say my best day ever, but nothing, nothing really beyond that. <laughs> Did you go out to like Red Lobster for the two hundred thousand dollar day? You go to No More Sizzler? You upgraded or? Oh boy. What did you do? Remember. What did you do to celebrate? What that's that's what I want to know. You know, when I had my first hundred thousand dollar day, I took my whole dorm out to dinner. Uh, it was Fire and Ice in Boston. I think it's still in business. Uh, it's only like $10 a person or $20 a person. Where would you do to celebrate your $200,000 day? Oh, she knows. <laughs> oh, does she have a question or she want, no, she, she have an answer? No, that's Hold on, we have an answer. She'll tell you what I did. Uh, we went to Mellow Mushroom and got pizza. Okay. <laughs> what did we get? I think I had a meatball pizza. I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> I think you did. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome story. My name is Tim Sykes, and I teach people to trade stocks. I am a self-made multimillionaire. So this is the ideal trade that I'm going to talk about. I want you guys to understand every single aspect of this trade. 